All right, welcome back. Shh. Welcome back, welcome back. Um, a handful of you have come to talk about midterms, but most of you haven't. Uh, uh, today is not ideal, but I'll be here Thursday uh, for a bit after class. Uh, and also Friday, I'll be here most of the day. Uh, the Dean's Investiture is Friday, so if you want to come by Friday, let me know. Um, any questions? Anything on your mind? No? Okay, we'll start. Uh, let's do a poll question to begin. Uh, here's your question. True or false? When the government exercises its police power over land, it will never have to provide just compensation. True or false? When the government exercises police power over land, it will never have to provide just compensation. True or false? Another 10 seconds. All right, so we got. Okay, uh, who am I up to? Bina. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Um, so, first off, Bina, when does a government need to pay just compensation? In what circumstances? Okay, well, you said taking through eminent domain. Does the Fifth Amendment say the phrase eminent domain? What does it say? Okay, so just based on the text, when does the government need to provide just compensation? Okay, when they're taking private property, okay? Now, Bina, here comes a million dollar question. What does it mean to take property? Um, what does it mean to take property? What does that mean? Well, I'll take the first case, for example. Uh, I'll go on to uh, Elizabeth. Are you next or that way? Elizabeth, OK, let me ask you a question. Um, in the first case where they tell the bookstore that they can no longer sell pornography, can they still use their property? So is that a taking? Yeah. Hmm. OK, well, you're sticking your head the other way. So is it a taking when the government tells you to use your property in one way, but you want to use it a different way? So okay, let me ask you this follow-up question, please. In the first case, the, the Pennsylvania case, would compensation have to be provided? Um, under the court's opinion. Okay, uh, now Elizabeth, let me ask you a question. Let's go back to a true or false question, right? What's the difference between a taking and an exercise of the police power? Okay, but, but wait a minute, no, no, no. Kayla just said a minute ago that even though you get to keep your property, they're just saying you cancel porn, right? Is the regulation in the Pennsylvania case a taking or is it an exercise of the police power? But could you see it under the government's perspective as an exercise of the police power? Yes, 
OK. Uh, thank you, the four of you. This is basically the rest of the semester, right? Is it an exercise of the police power, in which case you don't have to pay? Or is it an exercise of the takings power, in which case you have to pay? Right, that's, that's basically the semester. I, I'm, I'm only slightly exaggerating. Let's see how we did here. Uh, well, close to that should be. The answer here is true, right? Let me explain why. Uh, the answer here is true, and let me explain why. When the government uses its police power, it is not taking property. And therefore, they don't have to pay. The only time you have to pay is when you take property. Think of it as two sides of a coin, right? It's either heads or tails, right? It's either taking or police power. It can't be both, right? It's binary. And you have to ask yourself, what power is the government exercising? If they're exercising the police power, no compensation. If the government's exercising the taking power, then compensation is required. Everyone get that? Okay, so about a 40% of you got that one wrong. We got to think through that again, right? Elizabeth, you see the answer now? Okay, good. Okay. All right. Questions on that? All right. Um, the first batch of cases today we have focus on zoning. And we ask ourselves, is a particular zoning law unconstitutional? Is it a taking? Right? In other words, if the government wants to divvy up the property in this fashion, they have to pay for it. Does the government ever want to pay for it? Of course not. Right? That's money. That's taxpayer dollars. So in every single case, the government says, no, 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 this is not a taking. This is a property regulation by the police power. And every single case, the property owner says the opposite. Right? The landowner says, no, 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 this is not a police power regulation. You're taking my property. There are some easy cases, right? Uh, I think Abina mentioned eminent domain. Eminent domain is when the government actually takes your land, literally. They take a bulldozer and they demolish your house, right? Or they, 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 they make you execute a deed to give up some portion of your property, right? In those situations, there's no question there's a taking and they have to pay just compensation, all right? But zoning provides a more difficult situation. You get to keep your land. You can still live there. But the government dictates how you use the property. And the question is this. At what point does a land use, res uh, at what point does a land use regulation move from a police power regulation to a taking, right? Where is that line? How do you draw that line? And the first case, the Pennsylvania case, said the line was cross. OK, any questions so far? I think, uh, Dakota, you next? Yeah. Uh, can you please give me the facts? In the first case, Pennsylvania Northwestern Distributors. By the way, if you want to have an adult bookstore, that's the name you give it, right? Pennsylvania Northwest Distributors, right? That, that's like the most innocuous name you can think of. Uh, this made more sense for the internet, friends. All right, go on. Uh, oh, I got the winces. Yeah, it's, it, it's true. I mean. There are so many zoning cases involving adult bookstores and strip clubs. There are so many zoning cases in this area. It doesn't have as much saliency because people don't use these things as much, but it was really big in the 80s with VHS, right? OK, too much. All right, so go to go. Sorry, I went too far. Video cassettes, you know, VHSs. OK. Adult books, or it's just a little, we'll try and keep it a little bit nicer. Okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. I'm sorry. <laughs> and then a month later, they passed a new ordinance that prohibited them from operating uh, unless they built this new enterprise. Good. Um, and so basically, they had 90 days to change their use to conforming use to this non conforming. Oh, okay. Let me, let me just stop you right there, Dakota. You used a phrase that's correct. What does it mean to have a prior non conforming use? use a prior 
non-conforming use. What does that phrase mean? Good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let, let me let me just stop you there for a minute. Okay. Uh, zoning laws can operate in two directions, right? A zoning law can be prospective. That is, it applies to new land that's not yet been developed. There's not a problem, right? If we enact a zoning law today, and I buy Black Acre tomorrow, I am on notice that this restriction on Black Acre exists, right? Not a problem. But zoning laws might also be retroactive. That is, they might apply to land that's already been developed. Um, generally, zoning laws have what you might call a grandfather provision, right? Where they say, well, you were already here. You can keep your prior non-conforming use. That's what the phrase means. Right? You can maintain your prior non-conforming use for some period of time. Um, generally, you can keep it indefinitely, right? Unless you make some changes to the property, you get to keep your grandfather status. Um, but some governments have what are called amortization provisions. Uh, Alexis, what does this mean, amortization? Right. How, how many days do they have in this case? Um, I think 90 days. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, in this case, the government enacts what's called an amortization clause or provision. Um, in other words, the parties had 90 days to bring their business into compliance. Now, Alexis, what does that practically mean for the adult bookstore? Yeah, they have to maybe sell something else, yeah. right? So the business have to shut down, right? The business they want to have to shut down. Now let me just take a step back and talk about the process. Um, generally, government moves slowly, right? Government moves very slowly. In this case, the government did not move slowly. They moved rocket fast, right? If I remember my date, on, on May 4th, the books are opened up. And then like a couple days later, they, they announced a notice to amend their zoning laws. And then like two weeks, three weeks later, they have a public hearing. And then they say, okay, 90 days from now. So from start to finish, we're talking like, like three or four months, right? That this entire thing went through. Uh, this was common. Uh, this was a fairly conservative place in Western Pennsylvania, near Pittsburgh. Uh, and they freaked out. Um, did they tell you the methadone clinic uh, example before? No? Uh, uh, when I was clerking, um, did I? People. What? You're on my YouTube. See that she pays attention, right? So she knows all my good jokes already, right? Um, I tell them. It's not. It's not delivered, but it's like, oh, that's so funny. What I told it last year. Um, occasionally, someone says, Josh, you didn't tell that joke from last year. I'm sorry. Um, uh, when I was clerking in Western Pennsylvania, we had one case where um, a group wanted to open a methadone clinic. Um, uh, what's a methadone clinic? It's a treatment for people with opiate addictions. Uh, this was in 2009 when the opiate situation was sort of developing and people didn't quite know what was going on. But in Western Pennsylvania and Ohio, it was a huge problem already. People just didn't know about it. Uh, so this company wanted to open up a methadone clinic which provides treatments for people with opiate addictions. Uh, it's like a synthetic product that helps try and suppress the urge to, to take uh, the, the, these drugs. Uh, whether they're effective or not, I'll leave for someone else to, to argue. It's not important now. Um, the, the city, it was a city called Dubois, Pennsylvania, not Dubois, Dubois, Pennsylvania, um, caught wind and they figured this out. So they quickly enacted a zoning ordinance that said you cannot build a methadone clinic um, within 500 feet of a, uh, a school, playground, church, park, etc. You know, er everything you can imagine, right? So this group wasn't able to find a location to build their facility. Okay, but then they found one, right? On the, on the outskirts of town uh, by the industrial park. There were no schools there, there were no uh, churches there, it was just no one lived there. So they purchased this lot of land to build a clinic. Guess what the city does? There was a strip of grass in front 
of the clinic. The city dedicates that strip of grass as a park. Yeah. Uh, in other words, they couldn't build it. So, you know, the clinic challenged it. And there were constitutional claims which aren't very important here. But what I'm trying to convey is when people want to keep uh, something out of their community, they find a way to do it through zoning. Uh, one second to go to, I promise. Uh, it happens very quickly. And let me make this point a little bit more bluntly. Um, if you actually try to draw a map of any city in the United States with a 500 foot circle around every school, park, uh, 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 church, uh, restaurant that sells alcohol, which is basically every restaurant, right? There's no land left, right? Every single piece of property will now be excluded. Um, you, these laws make it impossible to exist. Um, often sex offenders have these restrictions uh, whereby they uh, uh, can't live within 500 feet of a school, a park, a playground, et cetera. They can't live anywhere. There's literally nowhere they can live, uh, which is why in some places they live under highways and underpasses because there are no homes nearby, right? Uh, it, it becomes actually literally impossible to live somewhere. I'll give you one other kicker. Um, it's often a crime to sell drugs within 500 feet of a park or a playground, right? Every public housing project has a park or playground in it. So it's like an automatic enhancement for drug deals. It's like automatic, yes, you're near a playground. Oh, that's, that's where you live, right? Uh, so, so effectively, these 500 foot rules make it impossible to exist. And, and uh, uh, this is one of these cases. There was basically nowhere in the community that they could exist, not near one of these prohibited places. And now they had three months to basically convert their entire business from an adult bookstore to, I don't know, a Christian bookstore, you name it, right? You know, go, go, you know, unlikely that was going to happen. OK, Dakota, patiently waiting. Yes, sir. Uh, so yeah, this happened to a uh, honky tonk that was going to open up in Rosenberg. A honky tonk in Rosenberg, my yeah, goodness. So you want to tell us more? Silverado, yeah. Mar and Grill. Uh, a honky like tonk. Actually, like a three story honky tonk place that was going to open up in like the 2000s. You know, I've been teaching for eight years. No one's ever used word honky tonk in <laughs> class four. Is that, is that like a bar? Is that what that means? Yeah. OK. Yeah. I, yeah. I, uh, OK, I'll take your word for it. Oh. And so the city basically uh, came up with every ordinance in the book to try and stop them. And finally, the one that stuck was that they designated part of the lot was specifically for, uh, was specifically like historical landmarks yeah, yeah. from Native Americans. Of course. And they said you can't have parking within 500 feet. Of course you can't. Destroy the entire Did property. they shut down the facility? Yeah. It didn't do you know if they went to court? Uh, no, because of pre-existing, like they, they knew they weren't going to be able to win. Right, so I think Dakota's story is similar to the one I put forward. Um, local governments, if they decide they don't want something in their community, they can move swiftly and promptly to prohibit it. And there's almost zero uh, judicial review to stop it, because it's deferential to the government. Now, you may say, well, so Josh, what's the big deal, right? Why do we want a honky-tonk? I've never even used that word in my life. Why do we want a honky-tonk? OK, honky-tonk uh, in our community? Or why, why do we want a methadone clinic? Why do we want an adult bookstore, right? Uh, maybe the argument is that, that the people should decide what is and is not their community. Um, the only backstop is the Fifth Amendment, right? And if they want to change how you use your property, maybe they should pay for it. Right? And that's what these questions are, uh, these cases are about. Any other stories similar? Well, raised honky tonk. Never, never used that word in my life. I've been here almost eight years. I've never, I've never used it. I, 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 I thought honky tonk had more of like a sexual connotation than just a bar. I, I thought it was something bad, like, which is why whenever students give me a word, I'm always cautious about repeating it, because uh, like they might be setting me up to say something I don't know. Okay, whatever. I am a carpetbagger. All right. Um, what else? Uh, any other thing on this? All right, let's go on. So I think, uh, Courtney, I think you're next. All right, so the city enacts an ordinance. I say you have 90 days to come to compliance. It's impossible for them to come to compliance. Uh, what happens next? Then he appeals and loses. He loses. Unsurprising. Generally, when you appeal a zoning decision to the courts, you're going to lose. Right. I mean, I'll, I'll come back to you a second, Courtney. This is a rare case where the property owner actually wins. Right. This is rare. Generally, the property owner loses in almost every single case. 
Uh, why? Because courts are deferential on matters of property rights. Uh, if you took con law, you'll remember the case of Lochner, a case I know very well. Uh, under modern Supreme Court doctrine, courts defer on so-called economic regulations, and this is one of them. A uh, village of Euclid was one of the cases that began to repudiate Lochnerism. Sorry, go on, Courtney. So describe the uh, Supreme Court's opinion for me, please. Where they ruled that they did win after they did Yeah, yeah, so walk me through the court's reasoning. They said that this was a taking and could be have to be reimbursed or compensated for the exhibit society and it would be reimbursed. Courtney, was this a, um, a, a decision based in the U.S. Constitution? Yes. He, Josh gave you the right answer. I heard him. Josh, what's the answer? The just, just say it out loud already. It's based on the state constitution, right? Um, and let me just pause here. Um, in constitutional law, in common law, you only study our federal constitution. Um, that's a mistake, right? We have 50, 50 state constitutions that have different rules. Uh, there was a really good book written by, uh, Judge, uh, by Judge Sutton called 51 Imperfect Solutions. Uh, about how state constitutions often provide more <laughs> protection of rights than does the federal constitution. Uh, even if the U.S. Supreme Court doesn't uh, particularly care about property rights, the Pennsylvania courts may do so. So this is a decision based on the Pennsylvania courts' uh, interpretation of their own constitution. So Josh, why does the, um, the, the court here think that the amortization principle, the amortization provision, runs afoul of, uh, state, of the state constitution? Because... Um we have a lawful non-conforming use, and there has to be more to destroy that. Good. What, what, what do you, in other words, in what circumstance, Josh, can the government get rid of a lawful prior non-conforming use? Um, unless it's a nuisance. Good, yeah. Abandoned or Good. extinguished by anyone. Yeah, in other words, if the property is perhaps a nuisance, right, maybe it's like deteriorating or maybe causing some sort of pollution, uh, if it's abandoned or if the government uses eminent domain, at that point, they can declare a non-conforming use invalid, right? They can remove the grandfather status, but I think of it that way. But here, nothing changed that would warrant removing the grandfather status. If the government wants to interfere, they have to pay for it. Now, Javier, does the court consider you know, maybe an amortization principle might be okay if it's longer. Maybe not 90 days, maybe a year, five years, 10 years, right? Does the court consider, would any amortization principle be permissible, according to the majority? No. Why not? Because it's depriving the landowner of their use that they had lost their gain at that point without just compensation. Very good. The court, this, uh, <coughs> The court rejects the idea of a phased out amortization, right? Even if it's not 90 days, let's say it's five years or 10 years, it doesn't matter, right? So long as the amortization, I'm sorry, so long, so long as the prior conforming use remains, they get to keep their grandfather status, right? There's a concurrence by uh, the Chief Justice where he says amortization is permissible if it's reasonable. Right? That there might be some cases where a phase out is allowed. Now, 90 days, he says, is too short. Right? That's why it's a concurring opinion. Right? 90 days is ridiculous. Right? Who can do change an entire business in three months? What if it was a year? Two years? Three years? Right? Um, he said at this point, the court can decide reasonableness. Of course, once the court decides reasonableness, there is a lot more discretion and deference to the government, right? In other words, if the government decides the policy is reasonable, then the courts may agree that the policy is reasonable. Uh, but ultimately, with any amortization, the business has to liquidate. They have to sell their inventory, they have to wind down. Right, you can imagine, what if a business took out a 20-year mortgage for a property, right, or they signed a five-year lease, and now they have a one-year amortization window. The state doesn't pay for that. The state doesn't say, you know, you're, you're to, to break a lease or to get out of a mortgage. Uh, what if you can't sell the property? You now have, a, you now have just a worthless piece of land. Um, <clears throat> I'll tell you that this Pennsylvania case is not 
not really the majority rule. Uh, most jurisdictions allow uh, reasonable amortization periods. Uh, what is reasonable, I'm sure, can disagree year to year. Uh, but the Pennsylvania court was uh, especially protective of property rights. This is somewhat of, a, of an outlier. OK. So if we get the holding then, right? The Pennsylvania court holds that the amortization principle here is uh, unconstitutional. It amounts to a taking, not a police power regulation, it's a taking. And because it's a taking, the government has to pay. And because the government's not paying, then this law can't go into effect. Right? It cannot be enforced. If the government wants to enforce it, they've got to pay up, which they're not going to do. Again, two sides of the coin. Is it a taking or police power? Here it's a taking, therefore it requires compensation. So questions in the first case, in the Pennsylvania case? I, 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 when I clerked, that was not too far from Moon Township. It's very close to the, pit, uh, the Pittsburgh airport. Uh, so I, I roughly know where this is. Uh, okay. All right, Lauren, let me ask you a question, right? Let's say you buy Black Acre today and you plan to build like a factory on it. And let's say tomorrow they enact a zoning ordinance and they say, um, you know, residential use only. And then, then you start building. Was there a taking there? <coughs> Why not? Yeah. Here's a sequence. Again, I buy Black Acre today, they zone the land tomorrow, and I start building on, on the third day, right? If you build after the ordinance goes into effect, it's on you, right? You knew the regime, you built it anyway. Therefore, there'll be no compensation. But now the flip side, right? If I start building it today and the zoning comes later, then there will be compensation because the value of your land was diminished and you didn't know. Uh, so if you want to think of exam questions or the like, it matters when the land was purchased, when the zoning law goes into effect, and when you actually have a non-conforming use. The Pennsylvania case was unique because the guy had his bookstore open before the law went into effect. Therefore, there was a valid takings claim. One second. But if he had opened his bookstore after the ordinance went into effect, he'd be out of luck. This is why in the case I mentioned, the clinic hadn't yet opened when they rezoned the land with the grass. Yeah, Jacqueline? That kind of goes towards my question is um, for your factory example that you were just given, if they bought a factory that was already standing. Uh huh, good question. That someone else built before. Open, like, to the public, does it have to be processing? Does it have to be like, or distribution? Well, let me, let me, yeah, let me, let me answer your question this way. Um, you can transfer the grandfather status, right? So let's say I own Black Acre and I have a, 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 a lawful prior nonconforming use, I have a factory that operates. And I sell my Black Acre to Jacqueline. She can keep operating the factory in the same fashion. But let's say she changes it, right? Let's say instead of making one thing, you make something else. Let's say you retool the factory. Um, the city can argue that maybe you've, you've abandoned your nonconforming use and that terminates the grandfather status, right? Um, this actually happens fairly frequently. Uh, there's an example in your book about a restaurant called Lundy's, which I've been to. Uh, it was this huge restaurant in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn, this, this ginormous restaurant. And it was in operation for like 30, 40 years. Um, it had a bunch of grandfather status, a lot of nonconforming uses. Um, the business shut down in the 1970s, in you know, 79, they boarded it up. And then uh, someone basically bought the land uh, in the 90s and reopened it. And they tried to uh, claim the grandfather status, and they were not able to because it was an abandonment. And the abandonment destroyed um, the abandonment destroyed the grandfather status. But this happens quite a bit. Yes, Pim. Exactly. Yeah, the grandfather status will run with the land. So long as the use is the same, very well stated. Um, continuity. It's, yeah, it's got to be continuity. It can't be abandonment. Yeah, I had one case when I was clerking. Uh, there was like a um, a landfill in Cincinnati 
that had been there for like 90 years. Like it was a garbage dump in the middle of the city. It had just been there forever. And the city sort of grew around the landfill. And forever, the government was trying to shut down this landfill. They tried everything in the book. They could not do it uh, because it, they kept it running in the same fashion. But that means they couldn't upgrade. They couldn't improve it. It was like the same exact landfill to the 1920s. And it's still there. I think it's probably still there today. Okay. Questions in the first case with amortization. I mean, generally, amortization clauses are fine so long as a period is not 90 days, something longer. But the Pennsylvania court found that state constitution uh, was a little bit more stringent. Okay. All right, let's move on. Um, the next topic concerns what we might call flexibility in zoning. Um, zoning codes are very rigid. You have U1, U2, U3, U6, you have all these height requirements, right? It's very strict. Uh, but circumstances exist that might justify uh, deviating from those guidelines. And there are two terms that I want you to uh, keep in mind and not um, confuse. Okay. Um, students confuse these every single semester. Uh, you will as well. I can't possibly make you not confuse them, but I'll try my best. Okay. You have to distinguish between a variance and a special exception. Okay. Uh, you need to keep these two terms separate in your notes. A variance and a special exception. Okay. Uh, what's a variance? A variance is where you deviate from a zoning law based on a hardship, on a case by case basis. Right? There might be a situation where a zoning law creates a unique hardship that wasn't anticipated, right? And because of this unique hardship, the zoning board has some discretion on a case-by-case -case basis to deviate from the law. And I'll give you an easy example, right? Let's say someone needs to build uh, a wheelchair ramp, right? They get into an accident and they need to build a wheelchair ramp. But the wheelchair ramp would make the, the front yard too small, right? You have to have a certain number of feet in the front yard. Right? In other words, you build a ramp all the way from the front door to the curb, you're no longer compliant with the zoning law. This, I think, would be a good case for a zoning board to give a variance. Say, look, you know what? We understand the law says you have to have a certain number of feet of grass, and if you put this ramp here, you don't have enough grass, uh, but we're going to give you a variance because this is a hardship, um, and uh, uh, we'll allow you to build your wheelchair ramp. I think just about everyone would say that's fine. Right? This is, uh, the zoning code wasn't meant to get people locked in their house. Right, we should allow people to be mobile, be able to easily exit and enter their home. Let's give this person a variance, and therefore they can build the, the wheelchair ramp. Right? That variance exists so long as a hardship exists. Right? If, if the person in the wheelchair moves and sells black acre to someone else who doesn't have that hardship, the variance can't be enforced anymore. Right? In which case you may actually have to just take down the ramp or something like that. Right? That's a variance. Yeah. Would that also happen if you sell the house to somebody else? Like in the future, um, say you build a wheelchair ramp because your mother moved into it, and uh, in the future you sell the house to somebody else. Now they have the variance. Them. Yeah, the variance. The variance may not last if the court. If if the zoning board says that the hardship no longer exists, they can revoke the variance. Yeah. Does the variance like wind up hurting them? Like, <laughs> Poor choice of words for wheelchair ramp, but yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That was mean. Uh, that was mean. I'm sorry. I, yeah, I know you didn't mean that. I'm, I'm terrible. I'm an awful human being. Uh, I <laughs> uh, it's a, no, she didn't, she didn't mean that. I, I, was being, I was being a jerk. I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, do, do, does it stay with the person? Yeah, I think, well, the hardship is specific to the circumstance. It might be a person, but it might be a condition. Like maybe there's several people there who need it. Like, you know. Uh, uh, you, you might have a, a family with certain needs and a couple of the children have the same needs, you know. So the, it, it, might, it might not just be one person, but it's based on the needs of that house at that point in time. I'm sorry, that, that, that was mean. I, I make bad puns sometimes, they're, they're too bad. Um, they're, they're terrible. Okay. So variances, again, are hardships <coughs> that are unforeseen and they arise on a case by case basis and they exist 
so long as this hardship is present. And, and the variance can then be perhaps revoked later. Uh, but the key is it's a matter of discretion, right? Um, this is going to sound awful, but you have to do a sob story, right? You have to go to the governor and say, here's why my thing is so miserable, right? This is so sad. Please take pity on me. Take mercy on me. Help me out. What if you don't do that? If you don't persuade them that you have a sad story, they'll deny it, right? So you have to, go, you have to really make your case. The boards have almost unfettered discretion over variances, right? The case here is a bit of an outlier, I think. But generally, the board doesn't get scrutinized. If they say, we don't think a variance is warranted here, that's the end of the story. Um, so I have a question about, like, how do you exactly go about doing this? Do you go to the board? Yeah, it's going to vary based on what jurisdiction you're in. But generally, um, the zoning boards have meetings once a month, once a quarter, whatever it happens to be. And they'll have a, an application for a zoning variance. Okay, and okay. you can make it in writing, or I guess you can make it orally if you need. But generally, you have to put something in writing to justify it. It's, I mean, a lot of this, I mean, let me take a step back. The people on zoning boards are not elected, usually appointed. Uh, they're not attorneys, they're not architects, they're members of your community. Um, and very often, if the members of your community like you, you'll get your variance. And if you're a bit of a jerk like me, you're not getting your variance, right? Um, it's, it, 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 favoritism plays an important role. Uh, there's, some, there's something in the notes about this where there was one, um, you know, one zoning meeting where people just fall asleep and they're not even paying attention, right? This is not government at its fine. I shouldn't say it's mean. Th this is not the sort of regular order you think of. These are very uh, ad hoc procedures with a lot of discretion. Okay, but that's the, the variance, the first one, right? Any questions on variance? Okay. The second category is what's called a special exception. Uh, and there are other names for them, and you need to know the names, unfortunately. Uh, sometimes it's called special use permits, or a conditional use permit, or a CUP, right? Uh, you'll see CUP sometimes. Um, they're all the same thing, right? What is a special exception? The legislature establishes uh, a, a certain criteria. You know, for example, um, let's say you want to build a store in a certain area, right? Uh, if the store uh, has a certain type of storefront, if it's a certain height, if it's a certain width, and a certain number of parking spaces, right? There may be four or five conditions. If you meet all those conditions that are established by the legislature, you get your special exception, right? In other words, there's no discretion, right? The board doesn't have discretion. All they have to do is check, do you meet the criteria established by the legislature? Whether it's a city council or the state legislature, whatever it happens to be, here are the conditions. There are four conditions. Check, 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 check. You get your permit. You get your special exception. You get your use permit. Right? The special exception does not factor hardness, I'm sorry, har hardship into it, right? It's not what kind of burden is this? Uh, you don't have to do a sob story for the special exception. You don't have to say, this is, my, my life is over, I really need this. All you have to show is that you meet the criteria that the legislature established. Okay? These are a lot easier to satisfy because you don't have to like persuade people about hardship. Hardship is very tough because it's subjective. This is an objective standard, at least it's supposed to be. Okay. Everyone with me? All right. Our next case focuses on the special exception, right? The New Jersey case. The problem with the next case was the legislature created a special exception process that was not very objective. Right? Uh, who am I up to? Uh, uh, Jasmine, patiently waiting, right? 
I know it's the worst when you're between cases. I do this entire like spiel, and then you're just like you're sitting on death row, just waiting. The New Jersey case, right? You got it. Uh, Commons versus Westwood Zoning Board. Yeah. You got it. Thank you. All right, you want to give me the facts, please, in Commons versus Westwood Zoning Board? Yeah. That's sure. That's fine. Okay. Okay, I think I said a special exception for it. I misspoke. I'm sorry. It, this, this, this is the variance case, but I think you're probably confused. So the next one's this, the special exception case. I'm, I apologize. Okay, so you have a situation where Mr. Weingarten wants to build a house, right? Uh, but the lot is not big enough. And let me just explain what this means. In most cities around the country, to build a house in a certain area, you need to have a certain amount of green around the house, right? You can't just build the house up until the borderline. So you have to have a certain amount of empty space. But the lot has to have a house of a certain size. In other words, you have to have a house of size X and Y free land surrounding it. On this land, it would be impossible to actually build a house the requisite size, because then you won't have enough green space around it. So basically, you're screwed, right? The land is basically worthless, right? You, it has uh, no utility. Uh, now, perhaps one option was to buy some land next door. That didn't work. And maybe another option is you say, all right, screw it. I'll just sell my land to a neighbor and let him build a bigger house. No, that didn't work either. So Mr. Weingarten is stuck with a plot of land on which they can't build anything. Uh, so Katie, Weingarten goes and applies for a variance from the, from the board, right? What happens at the board? Right. In other words, he's stuck, right? He's stuck with a piece of land in which he can't build on it. I guess he can take a sleeping bag and camp on there, I suppose, but he can't actually build any sort of permanent structure. Okay? So, you know, what does the New Jersey Supreme Court do? Do they uphold this um, denial of the variance? <laughs> Does the New Jersey Supreme Court uphold the denial of the variance? On appeal, we went against the Board of Adjustment. Okay. Why why they find that a variance was warranted here, Tanya? Um, they found that the house or the proposed building was still put into value of the surrounding property and still fit within the aesthetic What Tanya, what, what exactly was Mr. Weingarten seeking to do? To but what kind of house? A, a one Would that house have been the, the size required by law? No. He wanted to build a smaller house then, right? Did the New Jersey court say he could build that smaller house? Uh, the Supreme Court? Yes. yes. You sure? Yes. Good, yes. Okay, be confident. Yes. The Jersey Supreme Court says a variance is warranted here. And Weingarten should be allowed to build a smaller house, right? In other words, even though the house isn't the requisite size, something should be allowed to be built here. Um, and of course, because this is New Jersey, we are reversing the common law rule, right? Generally, the court simply defer to whatever the zoning board says, especially in a variance case. This is very rare. They actually found a case where the court overruled it. Of course, they found it in New Jersey. Um, the court explains that this house doesn't cause any nuisances. Right? It's not like aesthetically unpleasing. Uh, there's no support to the idea that this would diminish property values by having a slightly smaller house. Uh, on the other hand, there's a substantial hardship by making this land worthless. And the court's not willing to entertain that. Uh, the court notes that there are other houses in the neighborhood that are grandfathered that are non-conforming that don't fit the requirement. So it would, a, uh, it, it, it would not be that big of a deal. In other words, Weingarten got his variant and was allowed to build a small, not even a small house, but a smaller house uh, on the lot. OK, 
questions on that case? All right. Well, let me. I, I think someone asked me before about what that's been writing. Who asked me that? Was that Zach? Yeah. Um, often, what happens when you want to have a zoning variance granted, um, it's best not to go to the meeting by yourself. It's best to go with lots of neighbors and friends will back you up. You know what I mean? Right? So you bring your entire squad and you say, here are all these people that support my case. Uh, uh, and then you get a hashtag going. But the, the idea is you want to show it's not just you, right? This is not just for your benefit. You want to show that the community at large supports this. Uh, so you usually have to marshal forces to your, to your side to get these things granted. And you know, if the board says, well, if all these people are OK with it, then I'm OK with it. But here, I think you have the opposite. The neighbors didn't want this person moving to the neighborhood. Right? It, it wasn't stated, but I think there's some unstated politics here where the people there didn't want this guy moving in. Right? They just didn't want him moving in. If, if they actually didn't care, they would have just granted the variance. I think there was some sort of political is a wrong word, but just you know, societal objection to this guy, whoever he was, Juan Garden. I'm guessing he was Jewish. I don't know, but you know, it's, it's possible. Possible. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, questions on uh, that case from New Jersey? OK. Uh, uh, Katya, let's do the next case uh, uh, from Maine. Cope versus inhabitants of the town of New Brunswick. What a funny caption, right? That, that it, it's, not the, it's not the town of New Brunswick, it's the inhabitants that you're actually trying to challenge, right? You ever notice in criminal cases, like the people versus you know, so-and-so, the people versus New York, um, and defense lawyers say, no, 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 it's the government, not the people, because the people sound so friendly versus the government's prosecuting you. And they always have fights with uh, uh, public defenders on this one. The people versus the government. All right, uh, Katya, you want to give me the facts, please, in the, in the main case? Good. But there was a local zoning um, ordinance that it just well, it had to satisfy. Okay, so was was the ordinance here a hardship? I'm sorry, was it a variance ordinance or a special exception ordinance? It was a special exception. Okay, so, so second category. Very good. Thank you. So uh, there, they said that um, that ordinance is there's an exception to it, um, and the person had or the developers had. Very good. And it was not going, um, well, not since this is the purpose of the ordinance, uh -huh. and the use will not be valued or alter the essential characteristics of the surrounding property. Okay. And so the board denied uh, the developer the exception for, because it said that it didn't meet requirement two or four. Okay. Very good, excellent rendition of the facts. Thank you. Um, we have here a special exception statute, right? It's not a variance; it's a special exception. Um, uh, when you have a state government, right? When you have a state government that exists, um, state governments can create cities, right? What is Houston, right? What is Austin? What is San Antonio? Um, the Texas government basically chartered these cities. And the Texas government gave these cities certain powers. We're called home rule, right? Houston can't do whatever it wants. The mayor may think so, but the, the, the local government cannot do whatever they want, right? Local government is bound by whatever power the state gives them. Okay, so for example, in Texas, cities can't ban fracking, right? That's something only the state can do. Uh, cities can enact gun control regulations, for example, right? In the same way that the federal government is supreme over the states, the state is supreme over local municipalities. 
okay? The state of Texas gave legislative powers to the city of Houston. They can vote on certain things. And in turn, the city can enact zoning ordinances, well not Houston, but San Antonio can enact zoning ordinances that give these boards power. But what kind of power can the city give to a zoning board? Okay, they can give power in two regards. They can give power to grant hardship variances, which are based solely on discretion. And they can grant power to grant special exceptions. But here's the key point. With special exceptions, there is no discretion, right? All the government can do is check a box. Yes, yes, yes. Does it meet the height requirement? Check. Does it meet the length requirements? Check. Does it have the right colors? Check. You get your special exception. In this case, the special exception was different. The second factor asked, would this use adversely affect health, safety, and welfare? My goodness, that's broad, right? Who gets to decide what would affect the welfare of the people? That's a very tough decision. Can unelected members of a zoning board make that decision? The answer is no, they can't, right? They don't have what you might call legislative power. Their power is narrowly defined to check boxes. And I don't mean that as, a, as an insult to them, it's an important job, but they can't, defy, they can't decide what's in the public welfare. Uh, think of the fourth one, right? That a special use won't devalue or alter the character of the neighborhood. They're not just talking about property values here. Maybe they can count property dollars. But what's the character of a neighborhood? How do we define the character of a neighborhood? That's a very subjective determination. And it's a determination beyond the power of what zoning boards can accomplish. Yes, Jacqueline? So basically the court says that um, it must be like an objective standard for local. For special exceptions, you need to have objective standards, yes. For variances, it's inherently subjective. Why? Variances are designed, designed for unforeseen circumstances, right? Some new thing that popped up. No one saw this issue coming. You know, the guy needs a wheelchair ramp. Okay, we'll give some flexibility, some playing the joints to the zoning board. But with special exceptions, the legislature anticipates these issues will come up, right? They understand that you might want to build a store in the residential area. And if you meet these criteria, you can build a store. But the only power that's delegated is the power to check the box. Are you doing what required, yes or no? If so, you get the permit. But here, the second and the fourth factors were extremely vague, right? That they would say, does this adversely affect the public welfare? Well, that's a tough decision. Um, does the usage alter the character of the neighborhood? Well, that's a very tough exception. Okay? Everyone with me? All right. Now, there's a word that you may have studied in constitutional law uh, that you may not remember. John was in my class, so he knows it. What does uh, ultra, ultra virus mean? Oh, I'm putting it up. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, 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 I must have used this word. What's ultra virus? Oh, sorry. If I didn't use it, I'm sorry. Andrew? Yeah, ultra virus is a Latin phrase. I'll come back to you. I'll tell her. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. I thought you had it. Uh, ultra virus refers to a Latin phrase. And it means beyond the scope of powers. When a government exercises a power that they don't possess, we say they act ultra virus. Right? So, Tal, I'll come back to you. In this case, did the zoning board have the power? to decide what was in the general welfare and what uh, was uh, uh, altering the character of the neighborhood? No, they didn't. You used it and checked up poultry. Sorry, took okay. me a second. That's OK. Checked up, uh, did you use it and checked up poultry? Think of a non-delegation doctrine argument, right, where you ask, did Congress delegate this power to the executive? If they didn't, then the executive can't exercise it. it Works the same way in state government, right? 
did the state legislature delegate to the zoning board the power to decide questions of the general welfare? Tyler, what's the answer? They did not. Okay. And so therefore, what happens to this, uh, to this zoning ordinance? Is it valid? Exactly, yeah. and this is not as applied, right? This is not like in Euclid where you can challenge it in a particular case-by-case -case basis. It's on its face, facially invalid, right? The legislature cannot delegate discretion in this fashion. They cannot give discretionary authority to approve or disapprove with vague issues of what's the public interest and what's in the general welfare. Um, this kind of language would be okay for a variance statute, right? Because a variance anticipates uh, uh, some sort of occasional unexpected activity. But special exceptions are different, right? The legislature determines in advance what's appropriate and what's not. And at that point, once the legislature makes a decision, the locality cannot expand by adding new criteria, right? Whatever criteria the government establishes, that's it, that's fixed. Once you get, I'm sorry, once you satisfy the requirements, you get your permit, you cannot have it withheld. You cannot augment, you cannot add to it. Okay? Therefore, the statute, the, the, statute, the statute was facially unconstitutional and the, uh, uh, the court granted the exception. Because the, uh, the, the apartment building would have complied with everything else in the zoning law. Is that a hand? Okay. Questions on the special exception case? No? You want to understand? Clear? Okay, I'll move on. Um, the, the last case uh, is kind of a weird one. I always debate whether I should teach or not, but it's short, so I include it. Um, the last case concerns changes to a zoning code. Right? This is not where someone goes to the court, I'm sorry, to the zoning board and asks for an exception or a variance. Right? Because those are basically case by case basis. In this situation, um, some party requests that the government change the law going forward. Now, they may not change it across the board. Maybe they'll only change it in a particular place for the benefit of a particular party. Um, this phenomenon is called spot zoning. I don't think you'll ever see this in your life, but it's in the book, so I teach it. I always think you should cut this case, but it's a short topic, so I, I leave it in. Spot zoning. This would not be my 100 cases. This is one of the cases I cut out, by the way. Uh, spot zoning. Rob, you want to give me the facts, please, in the last case, state versus city of Rochester. This is Rochester, Minnesota, not Rochester, New York. I'm actually flying to upstate New York tonight, but uh, other, other one. Yeah, go ahead. The, by the way, the, the Mayo Clinic, if you don't know, is just very uh, well-respected uh, medical facility in, in, uh, in Minnesota. It's like you know, world famous. Yeah, go on. Well, were, were these condos built yet? Uh, how was the Rob? How was the land near the clinic zoned? Okay, right. Does that include high, high, you know, rise condos? Uh, no. Okay, so someone wants to build these, right? Right. Okay, very good. Thanks, Rob. Um, you had a very successful hospital clinic, the Mayo Clinic, but the land nearby was zoned primarily for uh, low density residential use, single family homes, multiple family dwellings, etc. Right. Uh, this is not unlike the Ashby High Rise, right? The Ashby High Rise was built near the Texas Medical Center. This huge medical complex and it's surrounded mostly by one family homes 
right? You would think maybe you would want to have a high density, high rise near a fairly uh, a, a popular hospital area where people can come and live, the doctors, whatever nearby. Okay, so here the owner wants to build a luxury condo and he applied to have the land rezoned. Again, this is not asking for a variance, right? He wasn't saying, oh my God, I had such a hardship, I need to build a high rise condo. Right? That wasn't what he was saying. Also, there was no special exception, right? The government didn't put forward a code that says, if you do X, Y, and Z, you can build a high rise. He chose door number three. He asked to rezone or to change how the land was characterized from low density residential to include condos. Um, uh, is that Brianna? Did he provide any sort of justification or rationale why he wanted this change to be made? Um, no, but at the meeting for the, the rezoning, for the great rezoning, um, they had discussed that it was a, the condominium was made with the purpose of this affordable housing finance. So he himself couldn't be the main reason, or he didn't have any reason, but it yeah. kind of and, and did he look for condos built everywhere in the city? Uh, what, what area was he just looking to zone? Just where he wanted to build this thing. Yeah. yeah. In other words, he wanted to build his, his place in one location. He only asked for rezoning that one location. Um, you offered no rationale why he rezoned. Uh, but I suspect the members of the board were not dumb. And they recognized that this would be a good location for wealthy doctors, uh, uh, people who work at the facility right to buy expensive condos which would contribute to the tax base so always about tax base and increase dollar uh, costs gabriella who wasn't happy about this decision uh, the, owners of the, neighbors. the neighbors why were the neighbors unhappy gabriella um, oh, you're right they wanted closer judicial scrutiny but why 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 do you think the neighbors did not want these high-rise condos even think of like ashby here here in houston with the yellow signs Yeah, maybe they thought it would increase traffic, right? Maybe they thought it would increase the that would change the character of the neighborhood. You would now have, uh, you know, all these doctors living short term. You would have people building homes and families. They didn't want to change. Maybe it'll decrease property values. They were worried about it. Yes, Stephen. Um, I kind of as well with this thing. Um, I sat in on a meeting like maybe two months ago. Uh, my mother, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law have a house in Sugarland, and their church is right at the sort of their subdivision it's a really nice area with big property and they wanted to build a three-story retirement community on the part part of the property of the church so oh yeah like two million dollars goes to the church for the they love the land but the city council came into the church and sat down and talked to everybody and tried to you know because they're all homeowners there and they all wanted to talk to them they said well we don't want to look out the window and see you know this this building is three-story it's a monster building like it's monster gonna be. so i mean i, I can imagine kind of what the conversation you wonder why it's so difficult to build anything, right? Because you have to satisfy so many different people. Uh, Houston is unique because you don't have to do any of this crap, right? It's just you just you, you, you start digging, unless you're Ashby, in which case you have eight years of litigation. But generally, in Houston, this wouldn't be an issue, right? Your building permits make sure it's safe, but you don't have to persuade people, people on aesthetics. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Gabriella, and, and Steve, for that. Um, so the neighbors weren't happy, right? And they challenged this. They say that this is... Uh, uh, this is not proper, right? Jalen, what exactly did the neighbors think was improper about this uh, rezoning? What was like, what was their argument? <laughs> I believe they were trying to really like call no one to turn to the neighbors and say, you know, we can't. Right, but, but what, what, what provision of law did they say that this rezoning ran afoul of? Right. When you go to court, you say, this violates what? Think back to Kamala. What does, what does every single case turn on, usually? Yeah. 
you're right. They say that this this should be reviewed with more more scrutiny. But what what provision of law does this law run afoul of? What are they actually arguing? It, it's not clear from the case, but what are they actually arguing? Think back to common law. <laughs> you're, you're laughing. You're laughing, Rachel? Okay, what what provision of law would this decision run afoul of? Ladder? Not delegation of power. We're talking about the states here. Anyone? I'll come back to you. What am I thinking of? Can you raise your hand? Say it louder. Due process. The due process clause of the 14th Amendment. It's not obvious. They don't even mention it, right? But what they're effectively arguing is that this is irrational. Remember that? Remember the phrase rational basis test? That sound familiar? The neighbors are basically arguing that the zoning law here is irrational. That this was not done for the public welfare. That it was done to promote special interests to help these, you know, the, the, the land developers. Now, you'll remember from calm law that economic regulations don't fare too well in court. When they're challenged, they succeed. Right? These challenges do not do well. Why? Because, because courts apply what's called a rational basis test. Right? When you challenge an economic regulation, the government doesn't need to persuade you that that rule is good. All they have to show is that this law has some rational basis, that there's some reasonable justification for why the city engaged in this action. What was the rational basis here? It may increase. The, it may help the housing crisis in the city, right? It helps the housing situation. Is that true? Probably not, right? These are wealthy people, not poor people living there. Does it matter? No, right? With a due process challenge, you have generally a very deferential standard of review, where the court doesn't second guess the legislature. And indeed, that's what happened here, right? That's exactly what happened here. The plaintiff has the burden of showing that the law has no relationship to health, safety, or welfare. Again, the plaintiff has the burden to show the law is irrational. The court presumes that the legislature knows best what's in the public welfare. Right? The courts do not second guess the determinations of the elected branches. You may call this approach a presumption of constitutionality. Right, the court presumes these sort of takings are lawful. And here the court applies rational basis review. If reasonable minds can differ, the court will defer. Therefore, the court upholds the zoning or the spot zoning. <coughs> okay. As a general matter, these spot zoning challenges go nowhere. They lose, which is why I always debate whether they teach or not, but it's short, so I include it. The, pro the the, the, the people challenging a decision, so they lose. Like in the, kind of like the yeah, it's like the first case, like the New Jersey one, right? Generally, <coughs> courts don't second guess denials of variances, right? Generally, the courts will not second guess a denial of a variance. Courts also will not second guess a spot zoning regime. All right, so Rachel, I'll come back to you with this question. If if these sorts of cases are always deferred, what role do courts even play here? Right? If, if they apply the sort of rational basis review, what, what role do courts even play? Yeah, but, but rational basis is deferential. I mean, what, in, what, in what situation would the court actually intervene to, to halt? Um, these sorts of zoning decisions. Maybe to make sure that 
Yeah, I think I think I think you're on the right track. The courts only intervene when there's some really egregious conduct, right? When there's something really, really egregious, something really terrible. Um, I think in the first case, you basically had this guy who was being screwed, right? His land was useless; he had nothing to build on it, and there the court intervenes. You know, here, okay, they're building a high-rise condo. It'll probably help the neighborhood. The courts aren't going to second-guess that, right? That's probably, you know, it's in the realm of possibility. But generally, the norm is that the whatever the zoning board decides, the judiciary, the independent judiciary, simply defers to that decision. So you're going to you're going to have very few cases in which courts set aside spot zoning because rational basis review is so differential. Questions? All right, let me summarize a bit and I'll preview our next class. Uh, get you out of here a little bit early today. Get out of town or save for watch the game. I don't know. Um, do not confuse variances and special exceptions. Uh, you will in the exam, I know, no matter how many times I warn you, but don't confuse them. Um, if on the exam I describe something as a variance and you start talking about special exception tests, you're in trouble. Uh, if you start talking about uh, uh, special exceptions, stuff for variances, you're in trouble. So please keep these separate. The, the variance is based on hardship in a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, the special exception is uh, uh, specific criteria established by the legislature. Okay. Our class for next, uh, our next class on Thursday talks about aesthetics, uh, uh, how things look and appear. Uh, this is a topic that makes me very angry. You'll see why when you get there. Uh, uh, but, but we'll talk about when can the city tell you you can't build something because it's ugly. Anything else? All right, I'll be in my office now to about maybe 2.15 or 2.30 if you want to come up, uh, but I welcome you to stop by. Thank you.